was being entrusted with a lot of people's trauma. It made me realize that I hadn't dealt with my own trauma. Are you actually feeling better? I feel somewhat back to normal. He said, no, that's to release the heat-seeking missiles that in case someone tries to shoot us down. If you could have dinner with absolutely anybody, dead or alive, who would you love to have dinner with? Can it be like a dinner party? Oh, I like that. I like that already. Hey, welcome to the Carlos Watson Show. Got a very special edition for you. It's February, it's Black History Month, and so we've got the most amazing segments. We call them woke history segments. They're great. My man Karamo stops by. He's gonna walk you through and introduce you to one of the most interesting figures in American history who's often forgotten, not anymore. You're gonna love it. First up, though, Alyssa Milano. We've loved her since she was in Who's the Boss? You've seen her in Charmed. You've seen her in Mistresses. She's now a podcast host, a meaningful UNICEF ambassador, and also one of the most important people in making the Me Too movement what it is. Hey, Alyssa. Hi. How are you? I'm okay. Thank you, Carlos. How are you doing? I'm good. It's, uh, it's crazy that it's February already. The year feels like, I don't know how it feels to you, but it feels like it's moving fast. I'm not mad at it moving fast, though. I think the faster it moves, maybe the faster we'll be out of this mess that we're in as far as the pandemic goes, you know? Yeah, yeah. Keep it coming. Well, I don't love that you got it, but I love that you're here with me and that you seem like you're in a healthier, better place. Are you actually feeling better, like like literally in terms of your everyday, are you? I am. You know, I was sick uh, in March of last year, and I feel like this is the first month that I feel somewhat back to normal. Like it was that, it was that long. And I still have weird symptoms every now and again. Like I'll have a shortness of breath or like the other night I was just laying in bed, my heart started racing and, you know, I have anxiety too. So, you know, when that happens, I'm sort of like, is this anxiety or it didn't feel like my normal anxiety. It's a tough illness to feel better because it attack so much of your body in so many different areas. Have you picked up anything new in terms of exercise or meditation, given, you know, that's probably such a fundamental physical change in how you feel change? Three weeks ago, I started doing Pilates again. Um, and some yoga and some meditation. So I'm trying to get up the physical resistance. I start a a movie in Canada in uh, three weeks. So I'm trying to build up my endurance. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, okay. And we're gonna shoot in Vancouver for two and a half months. You know what, Vancouver actually is a beautiful place and everybody seems like they're in shape. Everyone seems like they exercise outdoor all yeah. the time. You know, I think that there's something to be said for healthcare available to everyone. I feel like that makes a nation healthier, right? And Canada has socialized medicine, so. Interesting. So we know, were you on the Bernie train in 2016? I can't remember, were you? In 2016, I was on the Bernie train. You know, what he was talking about seemed to be the ideals that we should live by as a country. I didn't support him this time around because I felt he was too polarizing for a time that was very divided. But I have I have a huge love and fondness for everything that he stands for and everything that he fights for. Your family, do you come from a very progressive family or what, what's your family like politically? I come from a very politically active family family. So I was raised to be incredibly aware and that being a part of um, the direction of the country was a responsibility that we had as adults. And I was definitely one of those kids that could not wait to vote. And I considered myself more of a humanitarian, really, than an activist. I've been an ambassador since 2003 for UNICEF where my advocacy work was really about traveling the world and ensuring that children had a fair and equitable and healthy childhood. And so to deal with the last five years, um, it felt like I was in a five-year field visit, only in my own country. Oh, what an interesting way to put that. Ready? Very good. And one more for good luck. Uh-oh. 
tell me a little bit about um, Me Too. And I realize that's such a big conversation. I realize it's a conversation that thankfully you've helped drive and shape and been in. But like, what do you take away? What will you tell your kids or your grandkids one day about the last several years and the conversations in and around Me Too? I think it, it has affected how I have been raising my children, for sure. I have a boy and a girl. So we've had a lot of conversations, not around sexual consent, but about the idea of consent. Like, you have to ask your sister if you want to play with her toys. Like, just ask her. And if she says no, then you can't. And no means no. And so to raise kids with that understanding is something that I've been able to take away. I think the really interesting thing about the whole thing for me was, well, first of all, I sent out a tweet. I never thought that it was going to turn into what it turned into. As the days went by and we were still trending at number one and people started saying, you know, this isn't your thing. Tarana Burke has been doing this for 10 years. I reached out to Tarana and I was so relieved because what people don't know is that when this was all happening, I was being entrusted with a lot of people's trauma. And it made me realize that I hadn't dealt with my own trauma. And to have a mentor and someone who had really dedicated her life to transforming victims into survivors, I'm very grateful for Tarana's friendship because she recognized it because that's what she does. She works with trauma victims, right? And maybe two weeks into it, because we, we were in the beginning talking every single day, she said to me, hey, you know, how are you doing? And it was the first time I realized that this was a this was a personal thing for me. Four days into it, my my rep from UNICEF actually called and said, I just want to let you know that this has reached Ethiopia. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? And she said, yeah, two little girls who were being hurt by by their teacher went to the authorities and turned him in. And they said, me too, me too. And that broke me. That really broke me. But it was also such wonderful, almost like validation that the way in which I choose to use my social media was making an impact, but also was something that people were taking seriously. What would happen if given all of the craziness of the last several years, all of the tumult and the heartbreak and the heartache, what if we looked forward and said, how do we build America 2.0? How do we reset America? What would be at the top of your list if you were a co-founder at this new constitutional convention? What would you want to make sure was part of America 2.0? I think we got to start with healthcare. Um, and I think that that takes care of a lot of things because, I mean, people don't realize we live in a nation where there are food deserts. There are black and brown communities where people cannot find fresh produce because there is not a supermarket, there is a convenience store. So people only have access to maybe the banana and the apple that is in the bowl at 7-Eleven. This is horrifying, this affects everything. The intersectionality of what that means as a, as a nation is terrifying. When I do, I did a lot of work, work in Flint, Michigan after the water crisis, the fact that so many children were impacted with lead poisoning and the only thing that fights lead poisoning is nutrition. And so you had doctors in Flint that had to prescribe vegetables to children so that SNAP, which used to be food stamps, could get into this community and we could feed these children with lead poisoning with fresh produce that would allow for them to feel better. So I think healthcare is our nation's sick. We got we got to do healthcare. Do you think you'll ever run for office? I don't think I'll ever run for office. I'm much more of a like a boots on the ground, let's fix the problem person. You know, and I think that a lot of our representatives now, it's not even, and maybe this will change in 10 years, God willing, that we get some stability in our country. But I think our elected officials now, on the Democratic side at least, spend so much time not fighting for the things that they hope for, but trying to ensure that the things they've already fought for or the peoples who, whose shoulders that we stand on, that those rights don't get rolled back. 
And that just doesn't sound like a hopeful place to be right now. Now, who knows? Like, if the corruption is cleaned up and we get big money out of politics and it goes back to, like, being of service to your constituents, then I think that would be lovely. But um, as of right now, it, it doesn't seem attractive. Uh, best advice on dreaming fearlessly that you've either, again, gotten or given? I've had some really amazing experiences in my life. And I have seen humanity at its absolute best and worst. And I think that that's why I keep fighting for a brighter tomorrow and a more accurate depiction of the country I know that we can be. You know, when you look back throughout history and you realize like there has never been a time where women have not been discriminated against, it's quite an awakening. And that kind of shifted my activism a little bit. Like my my baby right now, the thing that I fight every single day for actively is the Equal Rights Amendment. So that has been my focus. I believe that we will see a time in, um, I'm hopeful, my daughter's lifetime, and I pray that I'm around to see it, that women are protected in the Constitution. And what a great message that will send. It's okay to be scared, but don't let it stop you. We're some of the most interesting places, whether it's interesting good or interesting bad, that you've been to. In 2000, I lived in South Africa for three months. And then my very first field trip as a UNICEF ambassador, I went to Angola. I walked through an active minefield with the Halo Trust organization, which actively digs up landmines and deactivates them or blows them up. But I would say the most interesting trip, I mean, those are all fascinating, right? If those are your runner-ups, that's, for, that's pretty good. Uh, so what is the most interesting? I was invited to go with General Franks to the Middle East on a USO tour. Tommy Franks was a general who led the attack on the Taliban. My last day, I went into Baghdad. I was with General Franks on his private C-140. And I did see out of the corner of my eye that there is a guy like this with like a button in his hand. I'm thinking, like, what the hell is he, like, what is he going to release? The the oxygen? Like, what is that? And so I asked General Franks, and he said, no, that's to release the heat-seeking missiles that in case someone tries to shoot us down, that guy releases the missiles so that the shoulder-to-air missile will find that instead of us. Well, being, with you know, having anxiety, <laughs> right, right, like I do. right. I'm trying to process that. This is not what I signed up for. And I look at him and I'm like, General Franks, I gotta tell you, I am freaking out right now. And he looks me dead in the eye and says, little darling, I guarantee you, we've got more bullets than they have. (laughs) And I was like, that's it. That's all you got, because I'm not so sure that makes me feel any better. Like, we land, and this, you know, there's, there, uh, there is a visual of this guy on a tank with his canine dog. It was like out of an Oliver Stone movie. I want to do something called rapid fire with you. Do you mind if I hit you with five or six kind of disparate things? Sure. What's your favorite book of all time? The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. That's a beautiful choice. What's your favorite color? Green. What would surprise people who think they already know you really well? What would surprise them to find out about you? Probably that I'm super insecure. Interesting. How old were you the first time you realized that you had anxiety? The first time I had a panic attack was probably early 20s, but then I suppressed that that's what that was because I was so afraid that I wouldn't be able to get insured. Because when you're an actor, you have to go for physicals and you have to disclose what medication you're on. And I was so afraid that I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to get insured. So I kept that a secret um, until I gave birth to my son, which was nine years ago. Best parenting advice you've ever gotten or given? You get out of it what you put into it. The role that you did not get that you wish you had gotten? Winona Ryder's role in Beetlejuice. If you could have dinner with absolutely anybody, dead or alive, who would you love to have dinner with? Can it be like a dinner party? Oh, I like that. I like that already. Jesus, Kurt Cobain, John Lennon, Audrey Hepburn, JFK. 
Angela Davis, Jackie Robinson. You've got kind of a good dinner party. You're going from uh, from Jesus Cristo to uh, to Jackie Robinson. You like the Jays. You had John Lennon in there. You had JFK. You had Jackie Robinson. You like the Jays. That's uh, what's your middle name? You don't have a J in your middle name, do you? Jane. Interesting. Alyssa Jane. This was so nice. It was so nice to meet you. Thank you. It's been it's been such a I appreciate so much you allowing me the time to reflect in a format that's not just short. Thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Hey, that was Alyssa Milano. Really appreciated her, appreciated her energy. So interesting to hear about her opportunities to do things all around the world. So grateful for her to all the good work that she and Toronto Burke and other people have done to hopefully make our society a little bit better. Hope it gets a lot better. Not sure that I agree with her that she'll never run for office, but but we will see. Hey, be sure to check out her podcast, Sorry Not Sorry, as well as, of course, her children's book series. But now, I'm delighted to welcome back my friend Karamo. He's coming back to the show. He's part of what we're calling the Woke History segment, where we find really important people and moments in history that often have been forgotten about, hidden, overlooked, but no more. Karamo's got a beautiful story to tell. I hope you enjoy. Who do you want to tell me about today? Byron Rustin, who is a prolific speechwriter. He helped organize the March on Washington. He was Martin Luther King's right-hand human being. He helped write the I Have a Dream speech. This is a man who literally has influenced and led the civil rights movement, but because he was black and gay, sometimes doesn't get the credit he deserves. We as African-American gay men always know about him is that this is the South. So your life was in danger, as first of all, as a black man. But then being a black gay man, your life was extremely in danger. And Martin Luther King knew how valuable um, Bayard was to the movement, understood that without him organizing the March on Washington, without him giving his words so that these speeches could be more impactful, without all the activism and everything he did, that a lot of movement wouldn't happen. That Bayard was able to release his ego and was riding in the back of the trunk while Martin Luther King drove, just so that he could get from church to church without being harassed, beaten, thrown in jail. And I just think about that. You are here giving the man that we all talk about to this day, that we honor and revere, giving him some of the words he's saying. You're planning the March on Washington, yet you are in the trunk of a car and you have the humility to say, you know what, this movement and my people, it's bigger than me. And I just think that that is such a courageous and beautiful act that we need to celebrate Bayard. I do not believe the war in Vietnam is more important than eradicating poverty, and I think history will reveal that. J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI was constantly coming after him in particular and trying to use him as a wedge uh, issue Mm -hmm. against King. And thankfully, neither of them uh, surrendered to that. And I think about the parallels of today and how like during the Black Lives Matter movement, we had to remind people that when Black trans lives were um, dying, that we need to equally highlight them as we did Black um, straight people. Because at the end of the day, there have always been people who have tried to divide the Black community or any marginalized quote-unquote community and say, no, you're over here, they're over there, which breaks down the movement. And when we realize that together, and luckily Martin and Bayard were an example of that, was like, no, everyone could try to like separate us and say, maybe I shouldn't hang with you because of you being a gay man. Maybe I shouldn't hang with you, whatever the case may be. But we know together we are stronger and that's going to propel us forward. I just think that's a lesson for people to even recognize today in 2021. And what I always tell young Black folks is that when it comes to Black History Month, we often look to the past, but understand that you are Black and alive today, you are making history in any action you take. Because whether it is just walking out in the world and being joyful, whether it is accepting a job and showing up and doing your best, getting accepted to college, everything you do is making history and it's guiding and opening up a door for someone else. Hey, listen, I didn't know that I needed to talk to Karamo today, but I did. Thank you for so much for always supporting me and let me come on your show, man. You know, it's my pleasure. Hey, that was Karamo. Thanks again to him for participating in some woke history. I love these segments. I hope you do as well. Also, a big thanks to Alyssa Milano, and I want to thank all of you for tuning in. 
If you're enjoying the show, remember we've got a wonderful podcast that sits alongside this, so be sure to hear those extended versions. Subscribe if you want to get notified when more good stuff is coming out, and bring a friend. Sharing is caring. I'll see you soon. Oh, 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 oh,